You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we are live, but we're letting it breathe just for, I don't know, two, three, maybe four moments, depending on how you define a moment. And we got to get Facebook and then we're going to get started. Looks like we're good. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle. It's powered by Blue Wire Pods. And I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me is my fellow football priest. He is the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kelberman. Zach, Monday has come. It is just about gone. No announcement from the team on quarterback. What do you expect to happen? I know you talked about there's your gut and then there's your brain. And they're telling you two different things. But now with 48 hours behind since the game, how are you feeling? I'm still feeling, and this is, you know, if you held a gun to my head, Chad, and threatened to pull the trigger, I would tell you that a decision I feel is still forthcoming. All the momentum seems to be indicating that. All the team, quote-unquote, insiders seem to be indicating that, including, first and foremost, Mike Kliss, who is probably the most plugged-in insider there is in Broncos country, and he thinks it'll be Teddy Bridgewater. So as much as I would like to see this be extended one more week and Drew Locke hopefully get a better, uh, a fairer shake better play calling, better offensive line play. I think it was the nail in his coffin, how he played and how Teddy played on Saturday. And if Fangio was leaning even a little bit toward Teddy, I think that was the confirmation bias he needed. So again, I'm going to go with my brain, not my gut on this one, or maybe reverse. I think in my heart of hearts, a decision I think is forthcoming and it's going to be Teddy. I don't know, man. If I had to bet on it, and this is not me trying to prognosticate, but if I had to bet on it, I would bet that they kick the can down the road one last game. And here's why. Like, if you look at it like this, you know, it's like an equation. And what, which factors in the equation weigh the most in terms of how the coaches view this, Zach? Because if you look at Teddy and Drew through two preseason games and you were to say, hey, let's just base it on which guy looked better with the ones. If that was your call in the preseason games, who would win that? Block. Okay. So there's there's one scenario. What well, well, what if it's maybe no, we got to factor in the entire body of work of camp. We got to factor in not just who looked better with the ones, but who looked better with the twos and basically average this thing out. In that scenario, maybe it slides to Teddy, but it depends on how big a margin that gap was between drew and teddy in their swing at the plate with the ones respectively and their swing at the plate with the twos respectively i submit that the difference is negligible between both and so if that's the case as i've been saying you err on the side of upside but i'm with you in that i think if it truly is up to vic fangio and george payton hasn't just been using that as kind of gm speak to absolve himself of this situation. I will be surprised if there is a decision tomorrow, I will be surprised if it is not Teddy. Yeah. And you can compare it. Uh, The thing I don't want to take away, and this is not me turning on Drew Locke or me becoming a Teddy guy. I'm supporting whatever quarterback is under center. I'm also being realistic in that it's looking like Teddy right now, but he wasn't exactly terrible either. Chad running with the second string against the Vikings. He put up points on offense. He moved the ball efficiently. The thing is though, he did that again the following week. The same thing they've been preaching for Drew Locke, Teddy Bridgewater showed. He was productive in both games. You cannot necessarily say the same thing about Drew Locke, unfortunately. And again, if Fangio, he says it's 50-50, but even if it was 51-49, that was all it needed. I think Saturday's game was to push him over the edge and make Teddy the starter. It's going to be interesting to see. Uh, Typically what happens is the the team will meet in the morning before they practice because they got a game this week, right? The Rams coming to town for the preseason finale. And typically what happens is they'll come in, they might have position meetings in early, and then they'll have a team meeting. Uh, If there has been a decision, the coaches will gather each quarterback individually, tell them the decision, and then they'll announce it 
to the players, to the team in that meeting, then it might start hitting the wire, players talking, texting their buddies and media, things like that, and then we'll know. That's if they make a decision. But again, because we're talking about here, you know, this isn't just, um, you know, Case Keenum versus, let's say, Chad Kelly, as an example. This isn't a decision like that. This decision actually is significantly more complex because you're not only talking about the short and long-term destiny of the team, but you really have put a lot into Drew and you've made a lot of sacrifices in order to put that development into Drew. And so what if I'm the, if I'm in that room what I'm saying is if Teddy has a margin over Drew right now is that margin great enough Zach to outweigh the fact that we put a lot into Drew he answered the bell this year he has gotten better we've seen the development is that margin of of difference in terms of where they're at in the competition enough to forsake that completely. Well, we have to look at the mitigating factor here. And it's it, the fact that George Payton is not the one making this call, Chad, it's going to be Vic Fangio making the call. And so we're told, right. I still think he's going to leave it up to him. I think Fangio is giving the coach full autonomy. He doesn't want to undermine him at all. He wants him to run his team and hopefully start watching the offense and getting familiar with the offense as well. It just seems like though, one of the conspiracy theories I agree with is that Teddy is way more of a Vic Fangio quarterback than Drew Locke is. And if you subscribe to that theory, you probably subscribe to the other theory that says Fangio is out to save his job and Pat Shermer as well, no matter what, under any circumstance. And who gives the best opportunity to be in games, let the defense win games, keep yourself afloat, not make that back-breaking turnover, the steady guy, that would be Teddy Bridgewater. Of course, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with the the large faction of Broncos country that wants the Broncos just to see what they have in lock because you can't do it in reverse. You can't bring lock in as a backup, and you, but you can bring Teddy Bridgewater in off the bench. I still think you go with upside, but it's not what we think. It's not what anyone else thinks. Yep. It's what Vic Fangio thinks. And that's the, uh, the scary part. That's the score guys. Uh, we got a lot to get to. I see a very generous super chat from Clayton. We're going to get to that here. And, uh, Bryson back in the house. Good to see you. Everybody that's in the room. Love you. Appreciate you. Thanks for being with us. We got to get to some matters of business and then we'll dive right back into the chat. And Zach, we got to start with an update on where things stand with our goals on Facebook. And look at this. People are taking our calls to action uh, to heart. You know, we have gained another three or so, four, two or three subscribers, uh, supporters that is on Facebook. And guys, when you become a supporter of Mile High Huddle on Facebook, you're not just giving us five bucks a month and we say thank you. You're getting some. You're getting access to our premium supporters only podcast content, which includes Kelberman's Corner every Sunday, Broncos Book Club with yours truly Saturdays, and the Trickle Zone with Eric Trickle Saturdays as well. So, guys, if you want to become a supporter, go to our page, milehighhuddle.com, or excuse me, facebook.com slash milehighhuddle, big blue button at the top, or even right now, at the bottom of, in the chat where you would type in your comment, there's a little green icon, kind of like an upside or an arrow pointing down looking little deal. Click that and it'll walk you through the sign up. Where are we on our goal to get to 500,000 stars to a Von Miller jersey? Yes, we're going to be raffling off a Von Miller jersey. And the people in the running are only those who contributed to the stars goal on Facebook. But we're also adding to that a cool little memento that's going to go along with it. A little MHH thank you, if you will, a little keepsake. And we're going to give a little, um, a couple of runners up type of uh, gifts as well to the top five. So the more someone has starred, the more tickets they have in the hat, so to speak. And then when we do the drawing, we will do it live. Draw it out of the hat. You'll see who the name is. And this is who the leaderboard is. This is how we know who gets how many tickets in the hat. Zeus McPeak, number one, still, of course. Love you, Zeus. Travis Weber at two, and he's starting to close that gap a little bit. Howie frickin' Day came out of frickin' nowhere and is now ranked frickin' third. Love it, Howie. Andrew Lampy four. Michael Ronquillo, five. Randy Jones, six. Travis Tarbox, seven. Sean Miller, eight. Gary Leeds Palmer, the legend himself, nine. Andrew Baker, ten. And then here's the dudes, and, and perhaps gals, I'm not sure until I scroll down, just outside the top ten. Claude, Butch, Pete, uh, Brian and Zebulon and even James, who's another kind of newcomer to what we're doing here as far as the stars and being a supporter. 
edging in Leaf, Shane Daniels. So, guys, we'll do an update here in a minute to see where today's stream stands and who's in the leaderboard there. But thank you very much for the support on Stars. It does support the channel. All right, guys, a couple of Did you questions. happen to notice, Chad, the symbolic percentage that we're at? Let's see. Speaking of Von Miller. 58%. That's right. That's right. Thank you, guys. Uh, connect on Twitter, gang, at HuddleUpPod, and our main account, at Mile High Huddle. You can connect with Zach Kelberman, at Kelberman NFL, myself, at Chad and Jensen. Also, gang, check out the merch store when you get a sec, HuddleUpPod.com. That's where you can get one of these hats that I'm wearing or that Zach's wearing. T-shirts, polos, tank tops, hoodies, face masks, little something for everybody. Uh, we have superstar design stuff, uh, merch in there, including that great T-shirt from Christy that the ladies in our community have really loved. So it's another way to support what we're doing here. And then and some dudes as well. Yes, true. This is true. It's a unisex shirt that Christy designed. Kindly also give us a like and a, and a follow the Huddle Up podcast page that is on Facebook, facebook.com slash milehighhuddlepod. And if you're not in a position to do those things, hey, gang, it's all good. We are seriously just stoked to have you with us. Just make sure you're subscribed. Please like this video, all right? If uh, you're on YouTube or Facebook especially, guys, that is crucial. And then if you think we're doing a good job, even if we disagree at times, but you'd respect the effort, share this episode out there and help us continue to grow and reach those new like-minded Broncos fans that are just like you. All right, Zach, let's grab this very patiently waiting boy, Clayton Merrick with a top rope super chat. Very, very generous. Clayton, thank Thank you, you, buddy. And I, Clayton, I think has supered maybe once or twice in the past, but he's not, he's definitely not a regular superstar. And to come in hot and heavy like that before we even went live and with a donation of that magnitude, Clayton, your football priests are saying, thank you. Bless you. Bless you, my son. He says, I've seen it before. Teddy being a dink and dunk quarterback, uh, defenses will sit on his five to 10 yard routes, stack the box to stop the run. The offense will start to struggle and we'll lose games because he has close to no over the top capability. You that's actually pretty well articulated in terms of the limitations. You're right. You're 100% right. But what remains to be seen is whether or not he can then counteract how they counteract him. Only time will tell. And that is if he gets the job, but we'd be lying to you, Clayton, if we weren't to admit we share similar misgivings. Yeah, but it's not all Teddy as well. Even if the Broncos had a quarterback that had dynamic arm talent, someone like Drew Locke, perhaps, uh, once a defense adjusts to that, no matter the quarterback, it becomes on the onus becomes on the offensive coordinator, the game planner, to counter the defense's counter, to put together a better game plan that can still exploit your opponent's weaknesses. I don't have faith that Pat Shermer is the guy. And when you put Pat Shermer, uh, a, a diminished Pat Shermer, who took a step back last week after looking pretty good in the Vikings game, with a quarterback like Teddy Bridgewater, whose arm is uh, not as explosive as someone like Drew Locke, that's not a very challenging proposition for a defense. And I think Clayton is spot on there. This Broncos running game, they better be good because once they get shut down, not if, but when that happens, the adjustment with Teddy and Pat Shermer is going to be difficult. And you got to have a prolific ground game in order to loosen that up. And you know what? I'm not sure that the Broncos are going to have it. I'm optimistic they are. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to throw a wet blanket on it. But, Zach, it was a little bit eye-opening Saturday night to see basically the first team O-line out there with Teddy and getting zero push in the run game. Yeah. I mean, that second possession in particular for Teddy that resulted in the Dalton Reisner scooping it from Javante and the whole thing. Dude, you had three tight ends set. You were freaking goal line heavy formation. A running back that's a physical dominating type cat in Pookie Williams couldn't move the needle, couldn't get over the line. It's a little bit concerning to me. And it's only one game and it's only, you know, it is against a Pete Carroll defense. They're stout, they're stingy. But if you don't have that, Zach, it's, it's you know, it's more than just like a, relief valve like it's you need that in a teddy bridgewater offense in order for him to lead you to success 
That rushing attack was not productive. I think they average on the ground like less than four yards a carry collectively, Chad. It would have looked a lot worse, though, if Javante wasn't breaking tackle after tackle after tackle, always falling forward. So I'm right there with you. The first team offensive line, the second team offensive line, they were huge letdowns in the Seattle game. We have to hope that's an outlier and not a sign of things to come this season. Clayton with a second very generous super. Wow, Clayton, thank you. Appreciate you, buddy. He says, another thing is, what's the point of having K.J. Hamler and Cortland Sutton to stretch the field if we have a quarterback that has an arm incapable of doing so? It's a wasted talent. Well, I feel you, Clayton, but here's the thing. Don't sell Teddy too short on this, okay? <laughs> like, the dude can make NFL throws. He's done it in training camp. It's just that he has to throw into the future. You know what I'm saying? Like, he has to really know what the look is going to be. He's got to know where he's going to go with the ball because he's got to be able to really wind up and create that torque and power to get it there. Like Zach, that throw that Drew made to KJ in, on that post in game one, that 80 yard touchdown, Teddy can make that throw, but he's got to let it go much earlier. And it's probably 15 yards shallower in terms of where it gets caught uh, than what you saw from Drew. So you can, adapt you know you can work around arm strength limitations but it does eventually come out in the wash in a lot of different ways we saw a repeat play from teddy to kj hamler against seattle and what happened it was underthrown. so i mean there's really no question that Locke has the better arm and Locke is better suited for all these weapons around him but again this is hopping off my previous point the Broncos had these same weapons last year. They had KJ Hamler, they had Jerry Judy, and they had Drew Locke under center. But what did they do with those weapons? Nothing. Zero. They squandered them because of the coordinator and Pat Shermer never got them involved. Ignored Noah Fan, ignored KJ Hamler, uh, either force fed Jerry Ju Judy too much or not enough. That's my biggest issue. It's not necessarily the quarterbacks, Bridgewater or Locke. It's still and will remain the coaching staff. All right, guys, I am uh, quickly just checking through the stream itself because the chat just did a jump on me, Zach, and the next bet, the next closest super is from Sam Bam, and I'm looking on the back end here. That jumped Anthony, Westside Philly, Darren, Joseph, Bison. Let's see, there's there's quite a few. Max, so uh, let me see. Hold up now. Max actually was in with supers prior to Clayton's. So really quick, I'm going to I'm going to get Max's in here and then I'm going to check on where we're at on Facebook to see what the rankings are. Uh, but first, Zach, real quick, let's take a look at what Max Power has to say from Can't across wait. the pond. He says, "Thank you Max for the super chat, by the way, my friend." He says, "Teddy's pocket movements were impressive. I agree. He makes the O-line better." Everyone was praising the second team O-line last week when Teddy was playing behind them. And then his second super uh, says, uh, also, I saw people say they'll stop watching if Teddy wins. Eric Trickle said that he saw people say they want Teddy to get hurt. Sorry, but a lot of Locke fans lack class. Yeah, anyone saying that, I mean, hit the bricks. No, Anyone wishing harm on Teddy, because if you're that much of a Drew fan, I mean, that's BS. You don't, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and make... Um, you, you shouldn't call yourself a fan type comments because everyone's fanhood is their own personal thing. It's like one's relationship with God, right? But to say that you want someone to get hurt, that's BS. And then saying they're going to stop watching. All right, cool. Later. Right, Zach? Well, first of all, I have not heard one Drew Locke fan or even Broncos fan for that matter wish injury upon Teddy Bridgewater. They might not want Teddy under center, but why would you root for the Broncos starting, starting quarterback to get hurt? That makes no sense. And the fans that say, oh, I'm not watching this year, I'm boycotting, okay, we'll see you in September. You'll be back, you'll watch the games as they go along like nothing ever happened and like you never said that before. But I want to make one point. Teddy did look good in the pocket. The offensive line, he, he made better because he stepped up. I just think the offensive line was better because they were better. Does that make sense? They were better because they played better. When Locke came into the game, he was literally sacked right away. Teddy, to his credit, he moved up to evade pressure, but he at least had three seconds to do so. Locke had a second and a half. 
before he can even turn around, a defender was in his face. And by the way, real quick, one more point. Yes, it's nice to see a Broncos quarterback stepping up, but that is such a uh, quarterback 101 maneuver. I I don't think we should be praising Teddy Bridgewater for sliding up in the pocket to avoid pressure. Every quarterback from Pee Wee to high school to college to the NFL is taught to do that. And just because the Broncos have one now, I think it's more of an indictment on the quarterbacks who weren't doing that in years past. True. Shane Daniels, thank you, buddy. Appreciate the super. He He says, what's up, guys? Just wanted to drop in and show some love. I can't wait for the meetup at the Jets game. Hashtag let them hate. That's right, gang. We've got the MHH meet and greet. That's going to be September 26, which is week three, right outside the stadium in Denver. Big old MHH tent in the South parking lot, tailgate sector of Empower Field at Mile High. We can't wait to see you guys there. Also, thank you for the super sticker, Darren Wayman. We'll keep an eye out for any of your comments uh, or questions. And then one of our longtime old school superstars, Bison M, jumping in. He's saying, I'm just saying hi with his uh, lock emojis. And this dude, if you guys are into metal, you know, I'm talking music here. You guys got to check out Bison's band, um, Sorsha. Check him out. Find him on social media. Connect with him and check out his music. Uh, Wreck and shop up there in Seattle. And then, Zach, here's Joseph Anthony. And thank you, Joseph. He says, with Drew Locke showing improvement with footwork, vision, and decision-making, he gives us the best opportunity to win our division. I do think that that's true if – he fully turns that corner right. because as we've seen over the last two and a quarter years that he's actually been, you know, responsible under center for the Broncos potential does not pay the bills. Right. I mean, production is what pays the bills and Drew's production has been spotty, which is why he was in a, you know, 50, 50 competition this summer. Yeah, I just I'm I'm reading this comment chat. I'm sorry, real quick from Daniel uh, Claybrook here. So Zach, all through the draft and the preseason, you're biased for Locke. I never had a bias. I, I supported both quarterbacks. How is it you simply shrug your shoulders and say, "Yeah, Teddy will get the nod"? Just surprises me as all as. What do you want me to do, Daniel? Do you want me to continue to be unrealistic and continue simping for Drew Locke when it's becoming obvious that Teddy did play better in last week's game and more than likely will get the starting nod? I covered this team with objectivity, not subjectivity. What I like to see Locke start, yeah. Do I like his potential? Yeah. But if Teddy Bridgewater is the guy, I have to accept that. I will accept that because I want to see this team win, and I'm going to cover them right down the middle. And, and no matter who it's been under center, I will continue to do that. Guys, first of all, I had to say this on Twitter today, but anyone telling you that they are purely 100% objective and unbiased is trying to sell you something, okay? We try to be objective. We strive to be unbiased, but human nature, it doesn't matter what profession you're in, biases, whether they are uh, front of brain or back of brain, conscious or or unconscious, subconscious, they're going to leak through to the surface at times. Zach, I don't think there's anything you got to recognize, Daniel. There's a difference between saying, I think it should be a guy and saying, here's who I think the coaches are going to pick. Right. Those are two different things, Doc. So for what it's worth. Um, and then, Zach, here's uh, Philly Will. I'm going to have to read this off of uh, the back end because it was a big super and it doesn't fit on one of the cards. He says, uh, Teddy, and by the way, thank you, Philly, uh, Westside Philly. It's great to see you. He says, Teddy hasn't come close to the potential value that Drew has shown with his clear progression this year. Remember, he only has 18 starts, and Teddy could not vanquish him. We have no future with Teddy, but possibly with luck. I don't disagree with that at all. I do not disagree with it. I have seen nothing so far, Zach, this summer to dissuade me from my overall outlook or opinion that it's in the best interest of the Broncos to roll it out one last time with Locke in the event he does succeed because they've put so much investment into him, all right? And they've made a lot of sacrifices to get him to this point. They went through that trial and error learning curve they took the L's on the in the standings in order for Drew to get that time on task, live bullet experience. And if they make the wrong decision here, it'd be one thing, Zach. If Drew had come in and completely crapped the bed and showed no progress, couldn't hang with Teddy, then yeah. I mean, it is what it is in that case. But because the margin, if it, if it tilts toward one guy or another, is so small, considering the water under the bridge and the investment, I, I just think you this is a team that would be remiss to go with Teddy because you can always go to Teddy. 
Teddy being a starter in the league and a, a understood guy, that toothpaste left the tube a long time ago. And I say, yeah. you know, at best, Zach, it's 50-50 in terms of how a guy who's, we'll, call, we'll just say, highly drafted quarterback, whether it's round one or early round two, whatever. It's 50-50 how one of those guys, if and when they do get benched, ever come back from that, period, end of story. Like 50-50 would probably be a little bullish. It's probably less than that in terms of guys that actually get supplanted, the coaches sit them down or whatever, guy comes in. You usually don't see those guys ever come back and factor into the NFL. Yeah, I was going to say, if if you think the Broncos are moving forward with Teddy and they don't have a future with Teddy, well, they're not going to have a future with Locke either because that would signal the end of the Drew Locke era, not just with their point of view, but his point of view. I mean, put yourself in his shoes. You're a young 20-something quarterback, never really got a fair shake in the NFL to see what your ceiling can be. You've been uh, going through a pandemic, injuries, this and that, and now you're being kicked to the curb again for a journeyman chat. And I'm with you. I think the franchise caliber uh, uh, label around Teddy Bridgewater left when he, with his knee injury, when that, you know, came and went as well. And he's been, again, when you're replaced by Sam Darnold, who's literally seeing ghosts on the field, what does that say about your viability as a long-term quarterback in the NFL? But the Broncos knew that they were complicit in making the trade, obviously, and they brought Teddy Bridgewater in with the public understanding it was going to be 50-50. Privately, though, I think Fangio all along, as soon as he saw him in person and realized, okay, this guy, the players love him. He's a safe quarterback. He's an accurate quarterback. I can let my defense win with him. I think Fangio took an affinity to Teddy Bridgewater. And seeing him play in last week's game and seeing Locke not step up to the level like he did against Minnesota for a, co- uh, for a coach like Fangio, very old school, very grizzled, who wants to win by field goals, not touchdowns. Teddy is the guy in his eyes. By virtue of tonight, Randy Jones has leapfrogged multiple cats wow. into number three uh, in the overall ranking. All right. It goes Zeus, Travis Weber, Randy Jones, Andrew Lampy, Howie freaking day. Look at that. And Simon, you're getting in on it too. I mean, you're you're all automatically with a uh, with stars of that magnitude. I mean, you're going to have a lot of tickets in the hat, bro. Travis, you're already highly ranked. Thank you, guys. Claude, Andrew Lampy, highly ranked. James Scott, hey, thank you for that support, brother. Travis Weber, legendary, legendary. We've really enjoyed getting to know you in these chats. Elliot Sean, another newer name, Welcome. giving us props, supporting MHH. Thank you for the stars. Jay Helms as well. Melvin Paulson, those three brand new names that I've never seen stars, Zach. And then, of course, the very trusty Andrew Morrow. And by the way, Andrew, your shirt shipped yesterday or was it this morning? Uh, so you should see it within the next couple of days. But, man, thank you, guys. Keep it coming. You are climbing the rankings. All right, Zach, real quick here. Let me do a little scroll down and see if I can still get to Sam Bam here. I think I can. Actually, let me do it. Let me do it this way. Let me do it this way. Bear with me, guys. I think I can. I think I can. Uh, Sam Bam in the hizzy. He says, and thank you, Sam. He goes, if Bridgewater is named a starter, then what is Denver's long-term plan for finding a franchise quarterback? Because it's not Teddy. It just doesn't make any sense to me when so much investment was put into luck. I feel you on that. Uh, but as Zach mentioned, if you go to Teddy, unless there's, Zach, some kind of fairy tale, you know, turn of events mid-season Teddy gets hurt Drew comes in and just goes on a tear it would signal the end of Locke in Denver if te- if they go with Teddy that's why it's a very fateful decision that they are making here if they decide to go with Teddy it has multiple trickle down ramifications um, if it is Teddy and let's just assume the likelihood if it were to be Teddy that Drew would be done in Denver the long term you know, maybe they if if they go on to have a winning season, even if it's you know nine and eight, and they make a wild card, they're going to err on the side of oh, hey, he got us there. Let's give him a quick extension. You know, see if we can duplicate right. it one more time with Teddy. But I would guarantee you, the Broncos would be going out and drafting someone uh, in the first round next year. I think that's the play either way for George Payton. I mentioned it yesterday. I mean, he presided over two first-round quarterbacks in Minnesota. That was Christian Ponder and Teddy Bridgewater. So I think now it's come time again where he wants to dabble in the draft, 
a uh, cost controlled young quarterback who you can build around and have long term viability with. That's not Teddy Bridgewater. That wouldn't be someone like Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson. I don't think they're going to be in play in that market. I think regardless of how Teddy does, if he is a starter this year, if Drew Locke is not starting, they will look heavily at the first round of the draft for their hopeful next franchise quarterback. All right, let's grab this one here from Randy Foster. Good to see you, Randy. Thank you. You are quickly working your way towards superstar status. He said, I always root for the Broncos first and foremost. It just sucks having no long-term vision if Teddy is the starter. I'm tired of the bandages yep. on a broken bone. That's right, buddy. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole, right? And then we also got Anthony Bomer. Thank you for your patience, Anthony. Appreciate your support. He says, I don't know if I can handle another week of this QB drama. I want the fan base to be united and excited about this upcoming season. This divide is killing me. I hope we know. There are many who believe that, ugh, hey, just name a guy. What's more important now is that you name the guy. It doesn't matter if it's the right decision. Name a guy so that the troops can fall, <clears throat> close ranks and fall in line, so to speak. I differ from that. I don't agree. I think what's more important at this stage is the preseason for a reason. More, most important thing is making the wisest, most calculated, best decision for your team in the short and long. Um, but I feel you. It's it's toxic. There is a divide. Comes with the territory. I can see it both ways. And, you know, I, if, if we've made it literally months with this quarterback competition. What's one more week? So I look at it that way. And if it takes another week for Fangio, if it is truly 50-50, if he's undecided, if he's unbiased, if he's not leaning in one direction, if one more game is the tiebreaker in this preseason, then so be it. But if he's leaning toward Teddy and there's really nothing that Drew Locke can do in the back of the bowl in this next preseason game, just name him the starter now. And like I said, let the other players know who their quarterback is going to be, who their leader is going to be, and start building some camaraderie on offense, Chad. They're, it's late August now, and they don't have their QB1 set in stone. We're going to be coming up to the Giants game soon, week one. I would like the team to know and build around that quarterback, no matter who it is. For what it's worth, people saying that there's no way Fangio could name Drew and maintain credibility in the locker room after what we've witnessed, that ethos, I'm sorry, you're tripping. When you hear someone say that, to me, that smacks more of bias than anything. Because Drew, I mean, at worst, has been equally productive, equally impressive. And it's unfortunate that with the twos, Drew didn't have a great game. I still maintain, though, Zach, he didn't have a bad game, and he was unlucky and unfortunate that it happened to be a game that the backup O-line second teamers just decided to uh, not play so hot. Travis, appreciate the love, buddy. You show lots of love, and uh, we love you back, my friend. Yeah, I want to um, make make one point, though, real quick, yeah. Chad, about Drew Locke's performance. Real, you know, the shovel pass to Seth Williams where he escaped pressure and showed some kind of backyard football. If that was Patrick Mahomes or Justin Fields especially, the NFL Twitterverse would be raving. Broncos country would be raving and wanting that for their own quarterback. But that Drew Locke did it, it's no big deal. Claude says five bucks is a cup of coffee, guys. Well worth it for the best Broncos analysis around. Go Broncos. You're, you're a kind soul, Claude. I, I got uh, love for you, my friend. Appreciate you. It's a gallon of gas nowadays, guys. Yeah. It's a can of corn, as one of my friends from Boston would say. You know, it's a can of corn. Uh, Simon, you the man. Really appreciate Thank you, me. brother. Superstar and super supporter on Facebook. Up there in Canada, too, by the way. He's a state of being cat through and through. Andrew Lampy says, I've seen real growth with luck. That throwaway at the end of the half with zero timeouts and six seconds on the clock. Locke sailed one, ensuring a field goal try. Right in the middle of a quarterback competition where every throw counts, <clears throat> that throw proves what a team player he is. Start lock now. Yeah, see, that's the thing is, you know, uh, every once in a blue moon, I check in on, on MHH competition, whether it's radio, blogs, podcasts. I'll check in on them and, and kind of check the temperature, see what's going on probably like three times a year. Today I checked in and one of the things that I I heard from people, I'm not going to name names, but one of the things I heard was, hey man, if you know the nuance of football, you know, anyone that knows anything about football, you could yeah. see that in the nuances yeah. uh, between Teddy and Drew uh, in Seattle, 
you know, they're pretty, the separation was clear. People don't know anything about football. They might not have seen it, but I'm telling you right now, that's BS, dude. That is BS because that is a small example of, yes, the Drew of old probably doesn't throw that away, probably loses his presence of mind and tries to make something happen because they were close to the end zone, right? He wants to get some. He wants to close the gap because Teddy scored. He wants to score. But instead, he saw the opportunity for what it was, and that was to execute a two-minute drill, get the ball into field goal range, and take the points so that you can go into halftime with a little momentum. I'm not sure that's something Zach Drew does if it's you know game three 2020. I know there was no preseason last year, but you get my point. First of all, nuance is like narrative. It's one of those trendy kind of NFL terms, and and no one out there is going to tell me uh, what I can or cannot think about the Broncos. Is going to te- you know tell me how I should analyze the team or how I should analyze football. As long as I have two eyes and a brain chat, I'll be spewing my own takes and my own opinions. But as as will you. But the thing with Locke, I, I think it is tangible growth. And you can say, oh, it's pretty sad that he's learning to get the ball the way in his third year, or he's a little more accurate. He's checking it down now. But that's all we ever wanted from him. Every Drew Lock credit, most of them said if he can just cut down on his biggest flaws, which are taking unnecessary sacks, uh, you know, committing turnovers, inaccuracy, just becoming unglued. They will be, get behind him. He'll become a better quarterback. Now that he's doing that, it's getting no credit and no acknowledgement, no recognition, Chad. He's standing more poised in the pocket. He's taking what the defense is offering him. He's going through his reads. He's running when nothing else is there. And you might say that's the influence of Teddy Bridgewater, and it certainly is, but that's also Locke's growth and maturity now with some continuity with the coordinator for a second year in a row. So, yeah, I see it too. And no matter what the Broncos – uh, come to their, their final decision, whether they name Locke or, or, or Bridgewater the starter, there is tangible growth from Drew this year. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Uh, Teddy from John Houston. Thank you, John. He says, Teddy is has never thrown more than 15 touchdowns. He's been on five different teams. He's a backup. So all that time with Locke wasted for what? Teddy? He was replaced by Darnold. Come on. Yeah, I feel you on that. Uh, and to Drew's, to 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 Zach's point, let me put it this way: to Zach's point, one of the reasons Teddy was brought to Denver was to also give Drew a model, to give Drew uh, some veteran help in the room, yeah. which he hasn't really had. Blake Bortles, I mean, eh. uh, Jeff Driscoll, nope. Um, Joe Flacco wanted nothing to do with, with Drew Locke, said on multiple occasions, great guy in front of the mic. Hey, I'm not here to coach up any young kid that's basically drafted to replace me. And I do understand that to a point. All right. He turned his back on him on the sideline, Chad. The guy was a child. I mean, come on. But listen, Drew himself has said Teddy's helped him a lot. And I think that influence of Teddy, you're seeing that combine two different things. One, Drew's. Film sessions with Peyton, I think, probably played a role. Yes. And then his exposure to Teddy and seeing how Teddy operates. And, and also just probably Teddy's helped him. Like, Teddy's not one of those guys that's going to turn your back. Teddy is a guy that will help you. He is a true leader. Whether he's the starter or not, he's a dude that cares about his teammates as much as he cares about himself. And I think that's why you're seeing a better pocket feel, a better pocket presence, better pocket discipline from Drew Locke. Um Here's one real quick, Zach, from Brian, and then I'll get your reply here. Brian Van Vorst, what's good, buddy? Appreciate you. He says, for people who say Drew played against – pardon me. For people who say Drew played great against twos and threes, let's get, get this out there. Teddy needed those four plays to get a first down against twos and threes. Drew didn't. Even Steven equals go luck. Yeah, th- th- look, if you don't get the fourth down tries that – Vic Fangio would kind of grease the wheels there for Teddy, whether it was in an effort to like swing the momentum Teddy's way. You can put on your tinfoil hat and think that way if you want, or just simply like, Hey, we want to try this. Let's, let's move the needle. We got some confidence that Teddy on a fourth down can move the chains. Either way, he got some swings at the plate in a artificial scenario, artificial format that I'm not sure Zach drew would have got if the roles were reversed. In fact, I mean, when Drew got his foot stepped on, right? He probably didn't drop back quick enough. Usually that's on the that's on the play, the quarterback when that happens. 
If that's Teddy, though, does Fangio, where you've got a multi-score lead at that point, does he kick a field goal? I bet you he goes for it on that fourth, and it was less than – it was like fourth and five. I think it was less than that, actually, off the top of my head. So that does – that helped. That did swing things. So if this really is even Steven, these are factors that the coaches are discussing in terms of the overall equation. In fairness, and correct me if I'm wrong, though, didn't Locke get a few fourth down opportunities against Minnesota? I remember the the first string offense going for it on a few occasions. So I think that's a Fangio decision. He went into the preseason thinking to himself, and rightly so. I'd rather the Broncos get one more practice play on offense than kick a field goal in a meaningless preseason game. But there's some truth to it. I mean, Teddy was kind of goosed along by the fourth down conversions, but it works both ways. And I think indisputably, no matter what, no matter fourth down, third down, Teddy made better throws than Locke did against Seattle. That's point blank. <clears throat> By the way, before I grab Zebulon, Dylan moderating tonight in the chat. Appreciate you, Dylan. He says, if you want to state facts, the context behind them is also a part of the story. Well said. Uh, Zebulon says, unless you call plays with no checkdowns, Teddy will take the checkdown 99% of the time, regardless of the game plan changing. Yeah, yeah. In fact, my brother, who's a big Broncos fan, shocker, uh, he was at a golf tournament and – traveling and stuff on Saturday wasn't able to actually watch the game live and so I met up with him today and he's like how to go and I was kind of trying to convey to him the play-by-play basically and finally I said you know what and I whipped out the highlights on YouTube and I showed it to him right and if I heard my brother say check down once I heard him while Teddy was on the field I heard him say it six seven times dude no lie and so yeah that's just that's his mo Zach when someone shows you who they are, believe them. And literally almost every single game of Teddy Bridgewater's pro career, he shows you that he is a very, very, very high upside quarterback two, but a very low upside quarterback one. But here's the thing. Fangio, and this is where I don't have a conspiracy theory, but I do think Fangio is leaning toward Teddy Bridgewater because they have a lot in common. There's a simpatico with, between the two people. And here's why. Fangio, as we've come to know, unfortunately, he plays not to lose a lot of the percent of time, Chad. He would settle for the field goal. He would play it safe and hope his defense can do the rest. What quarterback on the roster, A or B, Drew Locke or Teddy, is the better quarterback to play not to lose with, to check it down, to take what's there, and to hope to get points on any given drive and let the defense be the hero? That's as far as the conspiracy I'm pushing. I don't think it's too rooted in uh, fantasy, though. I think there's some truth to it. Uh, John, again, thank you, John. He says, Peyton, as a GM, should be strategic enough for the long term. Play Locke, see what he has. Uh, playing Teddy to save Fangio, then what? You draft a QB? He's not, Teddy, a long-term option. He's a poor man's Alex Smith. And then also, thank you for the super chat, uh, Illo77DA1. Appreciate that, my friend. But what's your reply to what John said there? Can you put the question back up? Uh, no, actually, <laughs> it jumped just barely. But the notion that you know he's a you got to think long term, not oh. just short term. Because see, here's the thing, Zach. I don't think you can. You, your decision has to has to satisfy both those buckets. It has to satisfy short and long term if you're making the right one. Well, my view on it is what I said yesterday. For for Vic Fangio, yeah, he's under the gun. He's coaching for his job. So is Pat Shermer. So is pretty much every coach on the staff and every quarterback and every player pretty much on the roster. The one person in Dove Valley who's not, whose job isn't on the line is George Payton. It's a honeymoon year. He's a rookie GM. Regardless if the Broncos win one game or 17 games, he is safe for next season. If they can get by and make the playoffs, he's going to look like a hero, George Payton is, because he's the one that kept Fangio. He's the one that brought in Teddy Bridgewater. He's the one that built this roster that got the Broncos back to the postseason for the first time in a half decade. But if they don't get back there, they have a down season, he think to himself, Oh, well, I was saddled with an incumbent head coach. I was sa- I was saddled with an incumbent quarterback. Now I can blow it up and get my own head coach and my own quarterback in the building and go from there. I don't think – that's why I think George Payton is leaving this mostly purely in Vic Fangio's hands. God help us all. I'm trying to find the Duchess here, and I'm praying I don't have to reverse engineer it. I'd rather not do that. We like to be able to show the actual Super Chats whenever possible because – we feel like it's just a better, um, 
you know, it's, I don't know, not a flex, but it's just, it's a better shout out than just reading the person's question. And unfortunately the, the chat has been so outgoing. I can't, it jumped her. So we'll have to do it the old fashioned way. Um, real quick here though, Zach, before we grab Michaela, we also have another very patient superstar who is as consistent as the day is long. Naj, what's good, bro? Appreciate you, my brother. He says, I agree with Zach's gut. It seems Fangio has wanted Teddy since the beginning. It's infuriating to think the lock era, and I'm going to correct you here, might be over, and we will never know what he could have been. Uh, hold on. What is it cut off? What it could have uh, uh, been. I hope I'm wrong, he says, Zach. Yeah, I mean, my gut is usually right about these kind of things. I, I wish it was wrong in this instance. I just feel like Fangio needed to see – Teddy step up and be the no doubt better quarterback because he wasn't in the first preseason game. And I think he was in the second preseason game. And I don't think Fangio, Chad, again, this is my own personal interpretation. I don't think he wants to keep facing these same questions anymore. I don't think he wants to keep hearing about the quarterback competition anymore. Keep fielding the same queries about the most important position in all of sports. So I think he wanted to call it as soon as possible, but he also backed himself into a corner with the even Steven 50-50 comments. Once he did that, he had to let it play out at least to this point. Now though, that there is on film, which Fangio loves more than the real life thing, he sees Teddy was stable, he was accurate, he led the offense, they were productive, and it seemed like the game plan was geared toward Teddy Bridgewater. That's no coincidence at all. And that's why I feel like my gut is telling me a decision is imminent. Quick update on where we're at on the Stars ranking tonight. And by the way, both Randy and Simon now co-own the record for the biggest number of stars in an individual stream. So shout out to you two, 10,000 stars. Wow. Uh, Travis, Thank you guys. Claude, Andrew, Shane in the four digits, Mark. James Scott, uh, Mark Lindemood, James Scott, Travis Weber, Andrew Baker, Brian Bowman, Melvin Paulson, Brad Murdoch. What's up, Brad? Another uh, longtime super, superstar and supporter. Elliot Sean, Jay Helms, and Andrew Morrow. Thank you, guys. Love you. Appreciate you. Uh, Tanner says, and thank you, Tanner, just showing some love, but I feel like they know who they're going to start, so just call it already. I'm over the, comp the QB competition. Hashtag state of being Broncos for life and let them hate. Well, I can tell you, Zach, if uh, it ends up being Teddy, there's a lot of people going to be hating, perhaps even Drew Locke a little bit in yeah. his heart of hearts. Yeah, because, you know, again, it's a very, or I, I shouldn't say very, it's a pretty high floor for a Teddy Bridgewater quarterback offense, but the ceiling isn't there. And if you want to survive and win games, 16, 13, that's one thing. But if you want to take down Kansas City, if you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Buffalo, with Baltimore in the AFC, if you want a chance to maybe average more than 17 points a game, Drew Locke is your guy. And the most infuriating part is, though, Chad, he has not had – he's in his third year now, not one full season. It's one thing if he was a full-season starter – Everything went according to plan for the most part, and he and he alone crapped the bed. But it's always going to be the question, what could have been with Drew Locke? And I think that's going to haunt the Broncos for a little while. Especially if they make the, the wrong decision. Uh, check this out. I can do it this way. Michaela, let me blow this up. Here she is in all her glory, rocking her Bronco mask. She's rocking the Christie designed MHH shirt, though you can't quite make it out fully in her profile pic there on YouTube. But you can see it at huddleuppod.com right now. That's right. And Michaela, love you. Thank you so much. We call her the Duchess of MHH for a reason. She's royalty here, legit and in our hearts. She says, how is Teddy the safer choice? He had 11 or 12 picks last year. They both had crappy years. They did. Yes. In fact, and thank you again, Michaela. That's the reason... Teddy, after getting paid, was shown the door lickety split, Zach, for a quarterback that, let's face it, it's not like they moved mountains and got Aaron Rodgers in Carolina. We're talking right. about Sam frickin' Darnold. Yeah, the quarterback that Justin Simmons still has nightmares from. Uh, and the thing about Teddy and Locke, they actually went through a lot of the same things last year. Uh, Teddy lost 
Christian McCaffrey in Carolina. He had a new coaching staff, new offensive coordinator in Joe Brady, who, by the way, craps all over anything Pat Shermer can even dream of. And, of course, last year, and, and throwing the pandemic and Locke had the injuries, the offensive line, the play calling. So, you know, you can say they're coming out of last season, they're on the same level, but it's if that was Locke, Chad, who got replaced by a quarterback of Sam Darnold's stature, we would never hear the end of that. That would be on his tombstone. But that's suddenly, you know, there's collective amnesia when it comes to that fact about Teddy Bridgewater. That's true. People would be trying to clown him nonstop, nonstop. Luis, what's up, brother? Thank you for the super. He says, hey, guys, I'm a Drew Locke backer, but is it concerning to you guys as it is to me that Drew hasn't been able to show to be the clear-cut winner at this point? Um, well... Look, I think he is the winner. I really do. I don't. That's not me predicting. That's that, what the coaches are going to decide. But I do think Drew, overall, and it's also considering too. Like I've said, some of the other factors. I'm going with Drew if I'm in that room making that decision because I know I can always go to Teddy whenever I need to. I would be remiss to give up on the kid, especially after he showed some strong strides forward this summer. What's more concerning Zach to me is the inverted version of that question, which would be, Hey, is it concerning to you that Teddy hasn't been able to show to be the clear cut winner at this point? That to me is more indicting than anything. How about this in terms of indicting and, and Luis, I'm going to assume that you're a lock guy and correct me if I'm wrong. I apologize if I'm wrong, but why isn't the opposite ever discussed? Teddy being the steady guy, the veteran, all this experience, uh, the more accurate guy, the more level-headed guy. How come there was no clear separation from someone as bad as Paxton Lynch 2.0 in Drew Locke? How come he didn't blow him away? How come this needed to take two preseason games and we still don't know who the Broncos quarterback? Again, it's collective amnesia, and, and they pick and choose uh, Drew Lock haters, what they want to forget and what they want to remember. But that's never talked about is that Bridgewater did not blow the doors down either. And you can make the case that he should have when compared to someone like Drew Lock. James Scott, thank you for the stars again, James. He says, uh, yeah, let's ignore the last eight seasons where Teddy never threw more than 15 touchdowns ever. True. I mean, today, another question, my brother goes, uh, well, you know, hey, man, Teddy's got that Pro Bowl year, right? I said, yeah. I said, take a stab at what you would guess his stats were that, that year. And no lie, this is what he said. Um, 3,200 yards, 28 touchdowns, 12 picks. And I said, hey, you were close on the on the yardage. It was 32 and change, 14 touchdowns, 9 picks. Dude got a Pro Bowl. Why? Well, because A, he was an alternate. He wasn't straight voted to the Pro Bowl. He was voted – enough to be an alternate and then probably two or three different NFC cues probably bowed out. And so bumped him up and two Zach or B uh, the Vikings were damn good that year. You know, they went, they won 11 games, won their division. I mean, they were a force to be reckoned with and that, you know, you've seen it. I mean, think about the Peyton years, right? How many guys on that roster during the Peyton years that made pro bowls, you could argue, rode his coattails to the Pro Bowl were undeserving potentially of Pro Bowls. I mean, even go back to his time at the, with the Colts. It's a similar thing. When the team has success, I mean, look at the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't know how many Pro Bowlers they had last year, but it was either the year before that, I think they had nine. Were there really nine Pro Bowlers on that? Or was that like heavy lifting being done by Pat Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and Tyreek Hill, right? If we're being real. But when the team has success, it trickles down to the to the individuals, and that's the reason Zach uh, Teddy got his his Pro Bowl nod. And then Mark says last year everybody was on the lock sucked bandwagon. Most people were, yes. Most people still are. That's True. that's that's the the crappy part about it. And real quick, Slick Ricka, since we mentioned you, I see you spamming the chat. You're gonna have to stop doing that, or else you will get booted. It's okay to. Put what you want, but when you keep spamming the same thing over and over, we got to put an end to that. Um, yeah, I don't know, Dylan. If you see that continue, go ahead and bounce him because that ain't cool. BNS wants to know, Priest, did uh, Rogesterman Ferris, man, I can't believe I remembered that, <laughs> land anywhere now that OJ Moody is down? Dropping him doesn't look so good. 
I'm not sure. I'd be lying to you. I mean, I could Google it, but we're about out of time. I don't think he's been cleaned so. up and picked up anywhere, but uh, you're going to be okay because, first of all, PS2, I mean, you're four deep right there. And, you know, it gives Parnell Motley, uh, Kerry Vincent Jr. had himself one hell of a game in Seattle. I mean, he wasn't like picking the ball off, but he was a little sticky man. He was everywhere, and he was not allowing separation. Really impressed with Kerry Vincent. So, uh, Ferris was cut for a reason, BNS. You know, I love you, but Ferris was the first corner cut for a reason. And it was not just because he was, you know, the newest guy in terms of like he knew the least about the, the scheme. Like, he had a couple of flash plays in his first two practices or whatever that was, Zach. But, um, the Broncos liked more from what they were seeing from the likes of Motley, Nate Hairston, Savion Smith. Uh, McCain, uh, etc. I don't get that though. You have people like Duke Dawson just taking up space on the roster, and Ferris comes in and literally picks the quarterbacks off two practices in a row. I actually thought they had something with Ferris, but say la vie. I don't think he signed. I think he's still on the open market. So maybe down the road, he's one of those Rolodex players that the Broncos could call in case of emergency. I mean, he showed pretty well. And about Michael Lowe real quick, uh, Mike Kliss reported yesterday they got better news. It's a hamstring injury, not a knee injury for Michael Lowe. Still sounds like a multi-week ailment, but not a season-ending ailment, thank God. So he'll be back at some point. And to his credit, Michael Lowe, he had a really, really good summer before going down. George Fox, I flashed your comment there because we do echo your sentiment. Um, and Travis, yeah, he got replaced by Darnold. Still scratching my head on that one. Uh, Chance on Facebook says, and let's see those stars, Chance. Let's go, dog. Get get in the running for that Vaughn jersey. He says, I'm in shock if Fangio and company play it safe, uh, but also not surprised Fangio has less creativity than John Fox and Vance Joseph and is the opposite of what we need to buckle up and go for it. It's sad. Drew Locke can become a Super Bowl quarterback. Don't see that with Teddy at all. Let the D line, let the, let Drew Locke. Every time I see DL like that, I think D line uh, grow. Yeah, I don't know about a Super Bowl QB, but I see still that that Drew has franchise tools and traits and upside. And what he needs now more than anything, gang, is the opportunity reps. Less creative than Vance Joseph and John Fox. You talk about an indictment on Vic Fangio. Boy, oh boy, is that one right there. And um, yeah, I mean, again, I don't know that Drew Locke is a Super Bowl quarterback like Chad was saying, or even maybe a franchise quarterback at this moment in time. But that's the thing. We don't know. We still don't know. It's August 23rd, and we've been saying that for months now since January. We don't know what Drew Locke is. And the really sobering part, the depressing part, is we may never find out, at least in Denver. Travis Tarbuck says, I think the amount of time and effort the Broncos put into Locke, it would be absolutely ridiculous to move on from him until we see what happens this year. He could end up going to another team and making us pay for mishandling him altogether. Yeah, that's a risk, but I'm telling you, man, more often than not, when a team pulls the plug on a young Q, whether it's sit down and hold the clipboard after being the man, or dealt away more often than not, that redemption story is not coming. I mean, that's it. That, I mean, they might end up being backups for a few years and stuff, but like, I mean, that's it. Look at Blake Bortles. Good example. Now he got a much longer, you know, run than anything. Even it's not even comparable to drew right now. Cause he had 18 starts only up to this point, but you know, Blake Bortles is never going to be considered anything more than a backup guy period ever. End of story. That's just the way it is. And even Sam Darnold, Zach, I mean, he's got this year, but what's his confidence like now? The team that drafted him top three trades him away after 18, 19, 20, I mean, three years, right? 18, yeah, three seasons, deals him away. I mean, it's no guarantee he's going to land in Carolina and suddenly look different because he's wearing a different uniform. Those intangible effects, those psychological effects, um, are real, which is why, again, hey, Denver, it's not like Drew sucked it up all summer. You can always go to Teddy. You risk more by doing it the other way around, in my opinion. What does it say, though? You laid out how bad Sam Darnold has been, at least as of late. So the Panthers acquired him 
and traded Teddy away. And not just that, they willingly are paying a chunk of his salary this year for him not to play for Carolina. What does that say about Teddy Bridgewater? So again, guys, if it's okay if you support him. It's okay that if you are not sold on lock, but you have to understand who Teddy Bridgewater is and set your expectations accordingly. Okay, we are at 59 minutes, guys. So let me just check here on the back end. We've got three that... Uh, we got the queen. I saw got that. got the queen and the chat. I don't know if you can see her on your end, but the chat... I'll scroll up. Uh, that dude that we had to uh, block. Yeah, I don't, I don't spammed know. it so much that it pushed her super out of my reckoning. Um, so let me... Uh, I can take a question if you want to engineer that. Yeah, let me quick. engineer something and you grab you grab one. Yeah, I'm just scrolling through the questions, guys. We are winding down. We're about to cross an hour mark. So if you guys have any questions, be sure to get them in now. It's the last call for questions. Um, I, I want to take this from Melvin Paulson. What has Teddy done but not but not be able to beat that a terrible Drew Lock? And yeah, Melvin, I'm glad you're bringing this up because it's always the the reverse that's talked about. It's that Lock can't beat out Teddy Bridgewater. But really, was that the expectation or was the expectation for Teddy Bridgewater to come in and look, no doubt about it, the more polished, veteran, mature, stable, accurate quarterback? That's how he should look. And, but even so, he did not outplay Drew Locke significantly in training camp practices. He did not outplay him significantly in preseason games so far, significantly. So what does that say about Teddy? Again, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. He'll make a nice pass downfield for about 20 yards on a corner route. Great accuracy, but he can't pump an 80-yard touchdown. Uh, he is limited as a rusher. He's limited for his upside. He's a career backup to this point that the Broncos are propping up as a quarterback one. So if you're on Team Teddy, again, set your expectations accordingly. All right. I have a solution here, but I'm checking one last thing. That would be, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, more optimal. I'm checking the actual stream itself. I can get Fernando that way. Oh, I can get Christy. Here we go. Where there is a will, my friends, there is a way. The queen jumping in, and uh, we love her. Love she's you, Christy. Thank you. Legit. She's the bomb. She's ride or die. Yes. Shotgun with MHH. Yes. Love the queen. She says, this is easy. Ted is just fine. If they choose Teddy, essentially they're saying they'll draft a quarterback and Drew will be done. Ted is a stellar number two. Might as well just put Drew in, let him rip, see how it goes. Then we know. And this is, I mean, if you boil it down, Zach, this is basically my thought process. And I'll be honest with you, and this is no lie, if Drew had come into this summer and showed no progress from week 17 of last year, I would be singing a different tune. I would be, but that is not how it played out. Drew did show progress. He did answer the bell. He has heard, shown that he heard his coaches. He heard his GM and that last year wasn't good enough for him either. So give it one last go. I just don't know how these coaches are going to play it. Don't know. He looked like the lock of new against Minnesota and looked like the lock of old against Seattle. But here's where I digress from that point. You also got the Pat Shermer of old. You also got the offensive line of old. You also got the tempo and the pace and the passion and the intensity of old. All those things were absent against Minnesota. That's why I thought the team, Drew Locke, Pat Shermer, everyone, Fangio included, was turning a corner. But obviously, it was a wolf in sheep's clothing, all of them, Chad. Maybe this, though, the upcoming preseason game, this will be a telltale sign of, who are the Broncos? What is their identity? What are they going to look like? A rough draft of the final product maybe can be gleaned this coming Saturday. Based case, legendary superstar. He says, Cliss seems to be the only reliable reporter calling Teddy the winner. Is he still the team's mouthpiece under Peyton? Maybe Locke has a chance. Um, yeah, he's definitely still the mouthpiece, but there are others. Uh, Albright, I tend to trust a little bit more. Uh, because not just because friend of the show and all that, but I don't know. He just, I just trust his, his reporting a little bit more in terms of things like this in particular, you know? Uh, but Cliss does, uh, Cliss wants Teddy. Again, yeah. it goes back to, you know, 
uh, everyone has a bias on some level. Right. And if you follow Kliss at all, at least the last three weeks, man, it's pretty clear that he's kind of been pining for Teddy all along. And it might just be that he's traumatized, right? From covering this team through the worst five-year stretch ever. Uh, but either way, it's a, it's a bias nonetheless. Well, if this Broncos gig doesn't work out for Cliss, he can always go be a part of the Seahawks announcing crew, Chad. They love <laughs> Teddy Bridgewater as well. He is the guy far and away. He is the, the prominent guy of Broncos coverage, of Broncos media. He wants Teddy. But I've noticed about 90% of prominent Broncos media, Troy Rank, I really won't name any other names beyond that, seem to be pushing for or gearing toward Teddy Bridgewater. Benjamin Albright is the one prominent guy that's been, if not objective, then slightly in Locke's favor. Fernando, it's great to see you, my friend. Thank you for the super chat. We got to get this one, two more, and then we got to go, guys. So hold off on them. Fernando says, I thought Locke looked good. He did what he could with what he had. I think him keeping drives alive and not turning the ball over really showed improvement. Zach? A lot showed improvement, not just not turning it over, but going through his read, stepping up in the pocket, making something out of nothing. Chad, he didn't try to launch the ball when he was under pressure. He did a little quick flip to Seth Williams. That improvisation everyone would be creaming about if this was Patrick Mahomes, it gets literal no coverage and no shine because Drew Locke did it. He's standing tall in the pocket. He's taking things when they're presented to him. He's not forcing anything. And through two preseason games now, he has no turnovers. That was his biggest blight last year, and he's corrected that. But again, no credit, no acknowledgement. The brainstorm. Thank you, buddy. What would be better, starting Teddy, then bring Locke in if Teddy's bad, or start Locke, then bring Teddy if Locke is bad? Uh, start Locke, then bring Teddy if Locke yeah, is bad. That's sorry, the only the, way you can go. The syntax on that fried my brain for just a moment here. Um, real quick, I want to flash Char, and then I'm going to read it. She says, so ever, and thank you for being a supporter, Char. She says, so ever since preseason began, I've been thinking about the QB battle. This coming from a Broncos for life fan. Ever since Locke showed his skills at the end of 2019, I knew there was talent that needed to be polished up. I have been trusting the process ever since. My take is maybe it's the type of coaches he has. I keep telling myself one more season, and I hope to God Pat Shermer gets fired. Uh, if, knock on wood, the Broncos don't do well. He will. Uh, because Locke did well under Skanks. So Yes, he did. Good points there, my friend. Um, last one here from Brad, and then one more super, and we got to go. Murdoch says, regardless of the QB sitch, I think we can all agree they're going to field the top five defense this year. With the new additions of Sertan and Jonathan Cooper, to name a few, I'm excited. Yeah, I, I, I would feel pretty confident in saying top five, but let's not get too far out of our skis. The quarterback they went against for most of that game got waived today, right? Uh, Magoo got cut today. So he could be back in groceries two weeks from now for all we know. So I do think that it's shaping up well for this team defensively, Zach, but uh, I, I don't want to jump the skis real quick. Last one, Michelle, the better half of Albert Knoppers. Good to see you, my friend. She says, first time commenting from a marketing standpoint on a comeback team, this quarterback competition is a brilliant marketing, marketing strategy. No matter what is going on in any other team's country, the Broncos are on everyone's lips. No one knows what to expect, and they want to know go Broncos. Well, that's for sure. And I mean, in Denver Broncos reign supreme. I mean, there's no sports team in the Rockies that can compete with the Denver Broncos, but maybe you're onto something there. Yeah. I, I want to say this again, though, um, for anyone who doesn't believe Jonathan Cooper is thriving right now, pro football focus listed its three highest graded defenders of this preseason. I think it was rookie defenders. Number mm -hmm. one was Jonathan Cooper. Uh, I, number three was Patrick Sertan. Number two was Micah Parsons. So I think George Payton did something right, Chad, this past April. Most definitely. Uh, Jules Romero, Bridgewater was on the verge of a franchise, be, being a franchise queue before his freak injury in uh, year three. We can still be optimistic if Teddy is the starter, especially with this roster. Yeah, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't completely uh, rule out the possibilities, Zach, but let's keep expectations in check there. 
That was a lifetime ago in NFL years. That It doesn't matter. He was on the verge of being a franchise quarterback, what, six years ago now? I mean, that's it might as well be 60 years ago. It's what he can do in the here and now. And what he's done in the here and now has been replaced every single stop, whether it's been New Orleans, Carolina, New York, the Jets. He had a cup of coffee with them. He's been replaced and relegated, rightly so, as a backup quarterback. And the Broncos are the only team that wants to go against the grain. Not unlike what they did with Joe Flacco. They were expecting it to haul out 2012 version of Joe Flacco, who beat Raheem Moore and led the Baltimore Ravens to a Super Bowl. They didn't get anything close to that because it's an eternity away. Uh, Muhammad, MHH resident male model in the his. Appreciate the superstars from a the, for the super chat from a superstar, dude. Love you, bro. Hope you're doing well. And yes, Travis, uh, some people, it's just troll behavior you know, roll with the punches. I need to get some moderation. Uh, we need to get some moderation for Facebook. It looks like because of the spams uh, over there, but Zach, we got to be done. But before we do, let's update everybody on the final tally um, for Facebook today. All right. Randy Jones, Simon at the top, Travis Tarbox, Claude, Andrew Lampy, Shane Daniels, Mark, James, Travis Weber, Andrew Baker, Brian Bowman, Paul, Michael Rogers, appreciate that. Shar in the hizzy. Melvin, Colby C. Collier, appreciate you, brother. Brad Murdoch, Elliot Sean, Jay Helms, Andrew Morrow. That's a long list, a long list, guys. We really appreciate the support. And, Zach, we would be remiss, especially after the way I titled this episode. Guys, no more supers, okay? We're just we're just uh, going to cover this one story uh, because we didn't. Broncos made five roster moves today. Real quick, Zach. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, who'd they cut? Well, first of all, the recently signed running back, Adrian Killens, suffered an injury Saturday night. He was waived, injured. Brett Jones, the center, the former Giants guy, suffered a uh, biceps tear Saturday night. Done. Put on IR. And then the Broncos waived the young guard, Nolan Laufenberg, and released the young rush linebacker, PETA. I'm not even going to try PT, I'll just say. Um, that means two. they still have two more cuts before tomorrow night or tomorrow's deadline. It might have even happened while we were live, Zach. I don't know, but do any of those names surprise you, sir? Not at all. I had actually predicted Laufenberg and uh, PETA. I, I'm not going to say PT would be cut. So, But can I just point out one thing? What kind of curse is going on in the Broncos running back room? Literally no one can stay healthy. You know, God forbid Javante Williams is the next one. They just picked Adrian Killens up because they had another running back that got injured because Mike Boone got injured. Let's hope this isn't a sign of things to come because they're having some bad juju in that running back room. Last one, Nathaniel King. Thank you, buddy. How many games has... Uh, Teddy played in compared to Locke. I would assume it's a decent amount more for the QB competition to be this close. Yeah, Teddy's got 50 some odd starts. Uh, Drew has 18. But guys, we got to be done for tonight. Thank you so much for spending an hour and change of your Monday evening with us. We'll be back Wednesday night. And then, you know, make sure you do not miss Broncos for Breakfast tomorrow morning with Nick Kendall and Scott Kennedy, as well as building the Broncos tomorrow night. 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. And with that, Zach, go get yourself some milk and sign us off. Well, in reverse order, sign us off, then go get yourself some milk. No one's going to understand why you said that, though, Chad. We're saving that to the last minute. Yes, guys, uh, unbeknownst to you, I did a whole show with a pretty bad burn on my hand. And you guys didn't notice I've been toughing through it. I told Chad this was my flu game. So I hope you appreciate the content and the podcast tonight. If my mouse can work and stop messing with me, there we go. If I can get to the banners, I want to run through it. I got it. I want to point you guys, if I could, again, one-handed, I can point you guys to Twitter. Be sure, guys, until we get back to you on Wednesday to follow the Huddle Up Pod on Twitter, at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main account on Twitter for all your Broncos news, analysis, film breakdowns, rumors, and so much more. Your one-stop shop at Mile High Huddle. Be sure, if you happen to follow Chad on Twitter, as you can see, at Chad and Jensen. You can follow me at Kelberman NFL. Uh, Also, go to HuddleUpPod.com, again, and get your swag on. Get yourself a hat, shirt, gator, coffee mug, Everything you can think of is in that store, including Christie's, uh, I would say female-inspired design shirt, but it goes apparently for men too. 
If you haven't already, go to facebook.com slash huddle. Big blue button, become a supporter. Again, guys, it's the cost of a cup of coffee or a gallon of gas nowadays. Five bucks a month, you get instant access to three VIP shows and programming. Kelberman's Corner, Broncos Book Club, and Trickle Zone. More on the way. We appreciate everyone tuning in. It's going to just grow like wildfire. We know it right now. Also, facebook.com slash Pod. Like that page and follow that page. But if you can't do any of those things, we love you dearly. We respect you dearly. We ask you to do these three things that take a few seconds. Subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel. Chad, it helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans more than anything else. We appreciate each and every subscribe, each and every like, and each and every share. We are off, though, as Chad said, until Wednesday night, 6 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Eastern. Be there, guys. We'll see you then. Take care. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.